I'm Stephen Foskett, organizer of Tech Field Day and publisher of Gestalt IT, and we are here at NGINX Sprint uh, 2.0 uh, in 2021. We were part of NGINX Sprint uh, number one last year, and here we are at the second edition of NGINX uh, Sprint event, and we have learned quite a lot. We've heard quite a lot about uh, what I like to call the little web server that could. Uh, you know, it's a little tiny web server, a little tiny bit of code, and it is everywhere. It is in everything and it does everything. And I think to me, that's the big takeaway from Sprint is that uh, this, uh, obviously, Nginx, the company, and Nginx, the product is a lot more than that web server, but that web server is obviously the heart of everything that's happening here. And I think that as we're listening and as we're hearing, we're just seeing so many different ways that that bit of code uh, can be used uh, from everything, from uh, you know enterprise applications to art projects, uh, which we just uh, heard about. So I'd like to throw it out there to the crew first. Um, you know, does it surprise you that uh, the the web is the heart of literally everything these days? I think for uh, for me, Stephen, it'd be a surprise if it wasn't. Um, you know, I think the um, you know I think the idea that everything there, there's a question asked earlier on. I think it it may have been Jason. He kind of talked about that idea of you know this kind of high demand web application is kind of the future of, of you know the routes that enterprise is going down it's the way that enterprise of all types you know it's the way that enterprise is communicating with its customers it's communicating with its end user base you know and we need to be able to do those things at scale uh, you know do them quickly and, and develop quickly and, and and i suppose for me maybe without jumping ahead far too much you know, i think what i've really taken from from this event and, and when i first looked at nginx uh, kind of a year or so ago you know that it, it, this isn't really my bag you know i'm not a developer i i you know I, I don't kind of work in in web development or anything like that but but i do work in enterprise it and enterprise architecture and, and i can see from an enterprise point of view that actually for those organizations who are looking to modernize the way they deliver applications what they really need is a is a wraparound that gives them security gives them some level of automation gives them some insight you know and the, and the thing that i'm probably you know kind of taking away from this event is that nginx seems to deliver all of that and seems to deliver that quickly and easily relatively straightforward to put in you know and and gives you some some real flexibility when it's deployed without kind of locking you in to, to their technology particularly so um so yeah the quick answer to your question was yeah i'd be surprised if the web wasn't central to everything else all the other stuff i said you got for free I think um, what, what Paul said there really resonated with me again, uh, probably similar to Paul's um, uh, experience. This isn't kind of core to what I'm doing, but what really kind of stood out for me based upon a lot of the other sort of Kubernetes related technologies I've looked at is their ability to appeal both to developers and to the ops teams. We've had lots of people on Tech Field Day or Cloud Field Day when I've been there and you generally hear of the problem of them appealing to one and not appealing to the, to the other. Whereas they seem to, to, to have that mix right, that there was people in the ops teams that really liked the wraparound that Paul was talking about. And there are those that are in the dev community who will go, yeah, Nginx, yeah, we use that. Well, th there's no question about that. That's fine. If you've got the tools to then uh, do that in the background, that's great. You don't have to convince me to use it. Um, and I think one of the really important things and not knowing too much on the history was that reaching out to the community. That was really clear um, during uh, the first day that they wanted to really emphasize that open source and the community and things like that were really important to them. And I can only assume there was some concern where the acquisition happened with F5 that, that that may be changing yes i was here or also last year and i'm wondering like like what are the delegates thinking of the past year development in nginx so there there seems to be a lot of different kind of roadmaps and products developing so do you have any like uh, interpretation what's happening so what is the overall direction uh, direction and what is the team here I really feel like Nginx has been doing a lot of wayfinding over the last year. I felt like at the last event, it was kind of unclear what the approach was going to be for the open source community, how they're going to interact with contributors. It feels like during this sprint, they've made a huge effort towards at least saying that this is what's coming. Open source is priority. There's going to be open source releases at every level of the stack. There's going to be documentation. There's going to be uh, greater interactions with the GitHub and the pull requests and issues. So for me, that's super optimistic as far as where the where things are going after the acquisition. Last year was I felt less certain. 
Yeah, I come at this from the other side of the spectrum where I am a developer, usually dealing with smaller deploys. And yeah, the open source tool is my core component, like just using the Nginx web server, it's reverse proxy, serving static files, TLS, all this fun stuff. Yeah, it, it's really great to see that, you know, I can do that now and a year ago and like five years ago, and it's it's still going really strong. Yeah, I like to, I like the growth and I like what we're seeing. Um, although I think I would probably like to see a little bit of rationalization. I think there's a lot of overlap in some of the products at the moment. Um, and I'm not a huge fan of multiple management interfaces and consoles and and places to do similar tasks. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of synergies in in some of the products we've seen. And, and I would like to see maybe some uh, consolidation into more of a, you know, a unified control plane to, to suit, suit the unified data plane. Yeah, I think I'd have to second that, Jason, that uh, there did seem to be a lot of overlap across the product portfolio. And I think there's a few different things that are going on there. One, they've got a bunch of different groups that are trying different directions to see what sticks and seeing what the reaction is from the community for one project versus the other. And then an important thing to go back to some previous comments from Barry and Paul is they're also trying to, to appeal to two kind of different groups. So we've got some operation folks on the panel. We've got some dev folks on the panel. And, you know, when I asked them, you've got these two different, uh, you know, control services, one that's an instance manager and the other one that's app control. And they, they seem like they do the exact same thing. And the explanation was, well, one is really intended for the more developer, non-NGINX experts. And the other one is intended for the experts who have a fleet of these NGINX instances that they want to manage and maintain. So that's definitely a factor in it. But I think the, the large thing is they're just really trying to reach out and see where can we go from here now that we have the backing of F5 in a relatively hands-off approach. Here's our opportunity to really expand so you have the service mesh and you have this unit and you've got the application delivery control and all of that. I think over, you know, we have to give each of those projects their own breathing room. And then a couple of years down the line, you'll see a rationalization of what didn't work versus what did work and maybe folding some projects together where it makes sense. Yeah, I agree. And actually, one of the things you're talking about service mesh there, and it just reminded me of towards the end when they were talking about they don't want their service mesh to be complicated like the historically the other ones have been. And actually, I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, we, we had a good conversation with service mesh yesterday and it, it is a complicated thing to do. And anyone that's going to take on the challenge of saying, we just want this to be easy for you to set it and forget it. Um, I think that that deserves some credit. I think going back to, to something that Ned said there around the kind of the, the proliferation of the products and the different places, uh, me with my ops hat on started to get quite confused when we talked about all the different places to management. We we had the first product and I'm like, great, this sounds like it's kind of aimed at me, someone that maybe wants the graphical user interface, just want to check in on how things are going, don't want to be getting down into the code or the, the bash or anything like that to go and see that. And then we saw the control plane. But we also heard yesterday about them starting to look at AI and ML and being in quite a unique position to be able to report upon the customer journey. I was actually quite excited by that, but by a business and an ops person, if they could do that, if they could pinpoint that actually, let's say, it, let's use the Audi use case, they figure out that whilst them in the configurator and looking at the car, it then takes me two months before I then click the button and end up buying in store. How can they use that information? That's really exciting. But there's then going to be another module created that's probably going to need another control plane that's going to be queried somewhere else. And that rationalization, even if it's in just the way that they pitch it to those various different people, that the, you can get deep uh, with the dev community and, and get down to there. But there is a very high level explanation as to what modules you may need to achieve that to the ops or the business people. I think that might be quite critical moving forward to get, deliver that clarity. Yeah, completely agree. I think one of the things that made me hopeful was they kept mentioning the fact that they don't want to go this alone. Like they want to have integration and partnerships and be part of a larger ecosystem. We saw that in their uh, renewed efforts in the open source community. And we saw that as they talked about how they're taking over some existing open source projects. I think it was the uh, open observability platform. Maybe uh, they're going to take responsibility for their own module and maybe some other aspects of it. Um, the other thing that it's got me thinking about 
is oh geez i totally lost my train of thought there <laughs> i was i was on quite a tangent um but yeah I, I just think they're they're not going it alone was basically my main point there they're not just going to build everything in a vacuum they talked about this insight plane uh very early on in in the uh in the talk uh, building out like their own ai and ml but i think that was in a larger context of we also want to be able to feed into anything else that's running ai and ml and make our telemetry and our data useful to those data lakes and processing components as well. Yeah, I think I get that, good, oh, uh, go ahead, Kadi. Yeah, I get that feeling like uh, with some of the products, maybe from uh, looking at a business point of view. So uh, something that they were trying to test like different kind of products. So what is the next best thing? And maybe I felt like the open source Part of part of it was like a stronger, and those were very strong products, and I got very excited of that part. Yeah, I, I feel like the the open source part that came from Nginx is rubbing off on the F5 part a bit, so that they're actually now kind of cross pollinating really, really well between the two projects. I think they needed each other. I think that the F5 products may have been, and I'm not a big F5 you know, know it all, but I feel like that they are benefiting greatly from the modern application aspect that Nginx is bringing to the table. And I feel like the reverse is true. Nginx maybe as an open source project, it's very hard to make money as a corporation, but I feel like having the F5, I guess, uh, IP, like the the App Protect, the WAF, all the, the kind of proprietary pits that are now baked into a Nginx is pretty amazing from a, a good split on value why I would want to like purchase Nginx Plus versus just sticking with the open source piece. But I feel like the reverse is true that they're keeping the open source product going very strong. They're adding new features. They're going to release more open source product. So it's, it's like, I don't see, it seems like a, a, a good match. And, so, um, maybe, maybe just to, sorry, yeah, Stephen, I, I just thought maybe just to kind of change the conversation slightly. Um, yeah, as I said earlier on, I'm an enterprise IT architect kind of guy. I, you know, I don't really do app development. Um, but, you know, I've spent a couple of days at the uh, Nginx, uh, you know, fountain of, of good hope. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking it all sounds great. You know, why wouldn't I want to do this? But but maybe for the devs in, in the group, you know, it, it is, you know, it, it, it is the real value in what these guys are doing, you know. So should, could I be taking this away back to, to kind of my enterprises and saying, um, you know, there's, there's real value in this, the, you know, this simplicity message, this security message that they've got, you know, that the, the, there is true value in this. Or, or a developer is just going to kind of turn around and say, um, that we're just happy to do it ourselves. I, I think there's true value in the Nginx Plus product. I think that there's those guardrails that they keep mentioning. I'm kind of taking a wait and see attitude on unit and some of the service mesh and some of the API gateway bits. I mean, those actually seem really promising, but it doesn't feel like we've fully fleshed out that story yet, but it feels like on Nginx Plus that if I was going to go back and sell this into the enterprise, there's enough to, to sell that story where I can st successfully use Nginx in any, in any in any enterprise. Like they're not going to object to some checkbox being missing because I think F5 has brought to the table a lot of those enterprise concerns. Yeah, so solving you know solving real problems. Yeah, you know, they're, they're solving proper business problems here. I want to take it on a very slightly different angle in that I'm really hopeful for the reference architecture piece, and from a from my background of uh, infrastructure and enterprise IT and these sorts of things, one of the things that fed I don't know, a good 10 years of my career was the FlexPod reference architecture. And it just worked because uh, this is what I need and this is how to do it. There's a lot to be said in providing customers the guardrails, but also the, look, this is the best practice. This is how we recommend you do something. This is how we've learned from years of experience of running these things. I think there's a lot to be said about just something as simple as that, putting out really good reference architectures with community wisdom. And, and I think that's gonna be a huge thing for everybody. Yeah, I think so too, especially if you're on a smaller team, it's like, you know, usually developers are gonna be developer or developing application features, not sitting there trying to put together a hundred different uh, infrastructure pieces on their own because yeah, it just doesn't make sense. So definitely a lot of value there. So just having a solution that's a potential best practice to look at, it's going to go a long ways. So uh, one of the things uh, that occurs to me after hearing this conversation is sort of the uh, enterprise IT implications here. So um, 
I get that uh, that they've done a nice job balancing between dev and ops. Uh, how relevant are these products to the traditional enterprise IT staff? How relevant are they to the traditional F5 customer? Or is this, uh, you know, a neighbor, a neighboring product line uh, for a different customer base? How, how much is there crossover between the traditional enterprise and the modern web application development? More than they might think. I think it might be the, the easiest answer. Um, what, does it, what does it mean to be a traditional IT ops person that you're only working on bare metal now? I mean, anybody who's been in the industry, you know, for 20 years has seen the transition to virtual machines. They're at least aware of containers. And it's not like web services are a new thing. Steven, you said it yourself. You are using Nginx at home. <laughs> I know you like to be the crusty Unix admin, but you're using Nginx too. And, you know, every time I put together a demonstration or need to dis show something being deployed easily and simply on a virtual machine or container, it's usually Nginx, you know? So I, I don't think it's uncommon to see in the enterprise and, you know, maybe it's not web logic and maybe that's a good thing. Uh, but even if you don't realize you're running Nginx in your enterprise, you probably are because maybe you're running some third party service that is leveraging it on the back end and you're not aware of it. Um, but more likely you are running it or at least some portion of your organization is running it. So I definitely think it's relevant. As for the relevance to F5 and how it hooks into there, I think the integrations are still slowly trickling out. But if I were an administrator who is looking for a solid integration for my dev team who's yelling about Kubernetes. Uh, the idea that I can now use an Nginx ingress controller and have that hook into my F5 to sync up the state and the configuration between the two of them, that's like a home run. That is like the perfect use case right there. I have to run Kubernetes on-prem. How am I gonna get index ingress traffic and stuff hooked into my F5 load balancer? That's how I'm going to do it. It's going to be Nginx. Yes. And uh, I've been doing consulting on that space, that enterprise IT consulting. So I feel quite familiar that, with that space. So for me, I think there were like two topics that were raising up. One was that development pipeline, that CICD automation of the of the deployments and the other was was there like OWASP security testing automation so that part was very very interesting and love to hear more about that one i've got lots of customers that are probably more in that traditional space and virtualization has been their thing for a long time but they do have in-house dev teams so they're kind of now finding that they've they've got to find their way around these containers that are ending up being chucked on their uh, desks because it's ended up in production and going out there and um I think there will be a comfort factor around that F5 relationship. They do have F5 already in their stack. So when they understand, and I really like that visual that, we, again, I think it was put on on day one, which was traditional applications, F5, modern applications, um, Nginx from that perspective. That was a very clear guideline for me to probably just have a conversation with those guys around. So what are you doing around the networking uh, side of the, your container deployments? How are you integrating that with WAF and, um, and all those other features? pieces so I, I do think that that will be relevant and i do think it will help those traditional it guys um start to come over to the, the new world of containers that they're gonna have to get their head around very quickly and i think um it's an interesting thing because the last 18 months have been a bit of a shift and it was a shift already happening but it's been accelerated and if we take the example of day one and we look at audi so i they were they did some some presentation there, but I'm going to just take cars in general. Traditional enterprise IT type people, the car sales. You didn't you had a website, but it wasn't your focal point. It was not your storefront. You walked into a showroom, the salesman gave you the power. You drove a car. You touch a car. Those are the things. Pandemic changed it. Ninety percent of car brands and manufacturers have virtual showrooms, full online ordering, from end to end. Like you don't leave your house to buy a car now. So people are having to make that transition. That's a necessity. You need to up your web game. You need to up your application game. And then in the second side of cars is almost all cars are now connected. We have applications, we have telemetry. It tells you what your last fuel up was, where, you, where you've been and everything else. It, 
they may well have been traditional IT enterprises for a long time, but now they're forced into modern application development and full online presence for upfront sales and aftercare. Maybe just to um, just to pick up on what Jason said and, and a little bit about what Barry said. I mean, first, the first thing for Jason is he's after the mantle of Rob's analogy king from yesterday. So, uh, so that was good work. Um, but but also, I think if if I'm you know if I'm sat in a meeting with a uh, you know an, an, a head of enterprise IT and a traditional enterprise, whatever a traditional enterprise looks like today, but if I'm sat talking to somebody in that instance, they they are under pressure. They're under pressure from their leadership to be investing in web scale investing in devops but they're terrified because they don't really know what it means you know and if i can sit there and say to them that we can do that you know that warm magic that is devops that you keep hearing about and you'd really like to adopt but we can do that with some controls enterprise level controls that you're used to does that sound like a marriage made in heaven for them you know and i think in a lot of instances they're going to say yes you know and and, and I, i feel that's kind of what nginx are you know we're bringing and, and actually a couple of people have mentioned the f5 acquisition you know while nginx may not be a name that's familiar to enterprise it they are going to get additional comfort by going oh f5 i know those guys don't they do this um oh now that now they do this this kind of in this modern space that's something that i'm happy to consider so so i think that you know that kind of crossover with f5 and uh, you know and that enterprise messaging is going to some you know value to both nginx and f5 uh, and of course to to the enterprise because it'll it'll open the open opportunities for them to see the nginx magic source a little bit maybe in ways they wouldn't have considered in the past yeah it occurs to me just uh, reacting to what you said there it, it, I hadn't really thought about just how easy it would have been for uh, Nginx or F5 to have fumbled this ball. Can you imagine if they had decided to use the open source web server as sort of like a, you know, just like a side project and like built, I don't know, like a modern web sphere <laughs> and, and, and told everybody that they had to use it. Um, and, and instead, uh, what we heard, and this for me was the big takeaway from Sprint this year, was the commitment to open source projects and the commitment to having functional, useful open source all across the space for almost every area that we've heard, which is you know something that they kind of didn't have to do, but they I'm really glad they did because it makes it more useful in this new world where open source is a an essential component for modern applications, whether it's you know enterprise or next generation uh type i mean it, it would have been very easy to mess this up and i was a little worried and they, they reassured me a lot yeah and what's really interesting about that too i mean i hate to use terms like this but it's like one of those unicorn tools right because it's like you can learn it once but then apply it to many different stacks so it doesn't matter if you're using rails Django, flask node phoenix laravel or whatever like nginx is probably going to be at least your reverse proxy and all sorts of other stuff and yeah it just seems like a really good time investment because it's like you can literally take a, a config that's working for a rails app and then put it into you know some node app and you're really not changing anything yet it's still working and i think if you um you know if you kind of look at where there's real success in the industry and it, it, it you know and actually the, the guys admitted i think it was yesterday that they talked about they they kind of felt that they had taken their eye off that community ball a little um you know and, and they realized that 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 was a mistake you know and, and i think you can see that in other enterprise vendors as well you know where you know they built built their business on that kind of community engagement engaging with the community developing their products giving great community support and as they've tried to stretch into the enterprise they've forgotten that but you've seen it all you know in lots of those cases that they've gone back and realized the value of the community and i think it's to, to add to what you're saying Stephen, yeah i think the idea that those community tools aren't just kind of throw away you know half-assed kind of tools you know these are fully functional you can run your business on those tools if that's the you know if, if they scale correctly to the level you want them to and if they they offer the capabilities that you want them to you don't have to use them as kind of your gateway in and then go and have to buy the enterprise tool you know they're not, they're not a 30-day eval they are tools you can actually use you know and i think i think in terms of a business that's that's built itself around community and built itself around open source i think it, it's it is great to see that they have you know kind of you know, re-engage with that and seen that as a priority and not seen it there was a second class citizen they've seen it as a proper route that you can take if that's the route you want to take 
But over here, we've also got these enterprise tools alongside what we're doing with F5 or what, what F5 and, uh, are doing with, with Nginx now that, that we've got all of those kind of capabilities. So you can take whichever route you like. You don't lose out because you've taken a route. You just take a route that's right for you. You know, I think that's a that's a really good message. You know, it's, it's a refreshing message in, in the modern world of IT, I think. Right. And to bring up like a gaming metaphor, basically Nginx is not paid to win. Yeah, I think they, they showed that off earlier today, uh, where they upgraded from Nginx open source right into Nginx Plus, and nothing had else had to change. They just reloaded the server, traffic kept flowing. I was like, that that's how this should work. Like, if I wanted to get those features, I shouldn't have to reinstall the world and figure out the new configuration. Uh, I, I'm glad they've not gone the route of like an open core. Uh, I feel like everything they're doing in Nginx Plus is built on top of the open source product only. You're not getting a crippled version in open source. Actually, you're getting more frequent open source releases than you were the plus releases. So that was also very optimistic. So just to wrap this up then, um, one of the questions, I guess the final question uh, here at the end of Nginx Sprint 2.0 for, uh, for our discussion pr perspective, is uh, what do we hope to see at Nginx Sprint 3.0? Uh, where do we hope that they take this thing? Uh, what are the what's the next uh, pitfall that they're going to hopefully not fall into? Uh, I think the things that I would really like to see at Nginx Sprint 3.0 or whatever they 2.5 or whatever they decide to call it, <laughs> I'm bad at semantic versioning. Uh, what I really hope is that the service mesh product continues to mature and expands beyond just Kubernetes. And I'd also like to really see what they're going to end up doing with that unit server, because I think right now it feels a little unfocused. It feels like they're trying to figure out what the best use cases are based off of what their customers are saying. I think that has the potential to work really well outside of a Kubernetes con context. So I'd like to see how that applies to VMs. And they mentioned serverless at some point. So I want to see how that model works out as well. So that's the sort of thing I would like to see at 3.0. I'd like to see the, the rationalization of those products uh, coming together with a bit more clarity for the, the relevant audience as to uh, what they use for. Um, and I think the other thing that I will pick upon, I've already mentioned it, um, I'd, I'd like to see delivery of, of that piece around the AI and ML. There's too many companies that are using it as a talking point. We've got to mention it in our presentation. It's got to be coming up. But if they truly were able to leverage their kind of position in the, the data plane and make it really extensible so the developers could go out there and easily get into it, easily have the queries, have the data lake, answer the questions that the business analysts and things like that want to be able to use and make it really usable, then I think that would be really, really valuable for them as a company. But whether they can de deliver that and whether they can deliver that in a year will be uh, will be a big question. Um, one, I'd like to maybe see if we could get back to some in-person events one day. Um, that'd be great. Um, but on the, on the other side of things, um, I think a lot of the foundations are there. Um, I'd like to see some further polish. Um, so API Gateway, it, it's a great foundation. I think they've got a lot there. But then I'd like to see it maybe dig into, speak to some of the bigger bigger enterprise customers. What What's their wish list? Um, what would be the next things that they should develop? Uh, I, I'd like to see some, you know, more advanced policy engines um, and, and some more, you know, some more of the uh, icing on the cake, as it were, when it comes to to fleshing out the products. I mean, I think maybe to, to build on that, Jason, as well, you know, there's, well, there's two things um, is to make the transporter artwork a practical transporter so they could just transport us to wherever the event should be. So so that seems like a good idea. Um, but but on top of that as well, I mean, maybe just to build on kind of things both, uh, you know, a couple of you have already said, you know, I think that kind of clarity of messaging. So, you know, Jason, you talked before about that reference architecture being a, a really valuable thing. I think the FlexPod example is a, a really good one. You know, I think more of those kind of architectures, because I think that will help for somebody like me, certainly that will help that kind of crossover from the, the, the world of development and, uh, and operations into that enterprise IT into that boardroom conversation about why you should be considering this. So, so I think for me, you know, clear, clearer messages around, uh, you know, and more examples of these are actual use cases. Cause you know, I, I love that idea of show me a use case and let me show you how I fix it as opposed to kind of endless presentations around here's all our features and here's all our customers who are using them. Show me what they fixed with, with your technology. So yeah, you know, that's a more of that kind of stuff as they develop would be great. 
I think next year for Nginx 3.0, I would love to see a rejuvenation of that open source community, like getting them doing more development in transparently on GitHub. And the second thing I'll, I'll kind of echo what Ned said, which is I think finding a place for unit would be a really interesting like place to see where that lands. I think if they could develop some sort of maybe similar to like AWS's Copilot, where it, it can generate the the wiring at the same time for you, because it seemed like unit still you had to, there's there's some figuring you had to do to make sure you get the things in the right spot. But if they had a one line command line to just basically deploy an app, you write it on your local machine, run a command deploy, and it runs in in unit in whatever server you've targeted, or you don't care, it's gone into some service mesh. Maybe there's a combination there with this reference ar architecture. I think that would be really powerful. Yeah, and I think you just reminded me of something as well. So back in day one, they were talking about rejuvenating that DevRel relationships um, and, and going back out to where the users are. So perhaps maybe between now and Sprint 3.0, we see a sprint on the road. Um, you know, at the user groups um, or at other events or just, you know, it, in the, the the forums and the discords and the slacks of the world. And, and they really start reaching back out. And, you know, there's a, a lot to be said with advocacy and, and, and relations groups and that sort of thing. So I'm hoping that'd be a, a big piece. I wouldn't mind seeing also maybe more coverage on how you can use Lua scripting to enhance the Nginx experience. Because right now there's not a huge amount of documentation on that, but there are a lot of really cool features you can do with Nginx around that.